I mean, when it just first started, you know, the first chord, you know, and have Alan conducting his own arrangement, it was just, yeah, the sound was just, it really is extraordinary to have mass horns anyway, but 300 odd people. The uh, International Horn Society started in 1970. And so what we did, we got straight in and got them and joined as associate members from Baxman, and therefore we got the magazine. You know, they'd had their first symposium and so on and so forth. Um, and you got people like, guys like Phil Farkas involved, and, and Barry, of course, Barry Tokwa, as their first president. And, um, you know, it was, it was fairly nonsensical, really, because we had no way of accessing what was going on in this country. For a start, they held the symposium in the wrong month. But any, even if people had, in 1971, the money to go transatlantic, because everything was held in America, um, it, it was the wrong month. They were on holiday, we weren't, schools were still in, and uh, universities were just finishing their exams and so on. So that was where it came. I thought this, uh, and, and as I read each magazine as it came in, I thought more and more, this is ridiculous. They're having all these things in America, and um, we've got nothing over here, no way of getting to it. So until 1976, and in 1976, they held the first, I've never heard about the second, mind you, <laughs> the first brass symposium. And um, the International Brass Symposium, which was held in Montreux. So we've been talking about the British Horn, what to do about a British Horn Society. And Barry said, does somebody like you to me? And that was John Waits who was there. The uh, Paxman uh, French rep was a man called Joe Hershevitz. Joe had a, an orange camper van, and we used to retire to the camper van. I think it was Dick Merriweather, Willie Watson, myself, uh, and Bob Paxman. And we were mulling it over, thought, well, why can't this happen in England? Then we all went out to dinner that night or the next night. Anyway, we had this, uh, this dinner, and we discussed that this is what we must do. John came back from Paris, came over, formed the British Horn Trust, as a charitable organization. And then we decided to hold the first festival, decided on an Easter Saturday when we're more likely to get people who are not working because we needed to be, to spear lead my dream of professional players and kids right the way through, all intermingling, all pulled together by one thing, the hall. And we worked our socks off. We, we stuffed envelopes, um, which we had to do, you know, we were sitting down in Paxton there, the end of a day, all stuffing away, there was Dick Merriweather and me and Timmy, young Timmy, Chris Tout, who was my senior assistant at Paxton. We'd done um, the Radio 3 broadcast, we'd done an LBC broadcast, we'd been in various newspapers and that sort of thing, you know, we really went to town and made sure. At the time, I mean, I was just a young lad working um, in Paxton's and what was extraordinary about it was the sort of buzz that it created because you know nothing like that had really happened in the UK before you know we'd had um, and I'd, I'd been through Paxton's been to some of the international ones but it was very much International Horn Society was a thing that wasn't on anybody's radar so to sort of have a horn gathering in the UK, just created such a, an incredible buzz, and, and, and so much so that um, when it was announced, I mean, the tickets just sold. I mean, I think, I think it was a capacity of 350 or something. They, they sold out within a week or so. It, it crept above 500, <laughs> and we were worried about this because it got so many. It, it was very nice, a nice problem to have. We had, we had tape measures to see how many, you know, squeezing up the chairs and see, just to see physically how many people we could get in there, you know, cramming people in, because we, I think we could have sold four or five times the tickets, actually. So the very morning, we'd hired a lorry, Bob Paxman and I, Chris Town, John Ward, 
um, went to this place and hired a hundred chairs and took them to the guild hall all before it started, put them in to the recital hall and added it to them. And of course we had to take it all back at the end of the day, which is fairly knackering, but uh, that's what we had to do because we were over 500. Um, Alan um, had been a friend of mine since 1959. I said, this is what I'd like to do. Would you back me? And he said, yeah, listen carefully. We talked it through, we had, you know, over, over quite a few of those. Um, so Alan uh, came along. Young people today don't really realise it's not their fault, but um, you know, Alan, Alan was such a huge figure in, in UK horn playing. Um, obviously, the two, the two biggest figures in UK horn playing and, and arguably the world horn playing for a long time were Barry and, um, and Alan. You know, and um, to have them two headlining the artists that were going to be there was, it was yeah, that, that was extraordinary. And then they were both excited to do it, you know. I think originally it was Barry who was at the festival. I think it was one of, if Barry's on board, then um, you, you won't get Alan Civil. Um, but of course, they, they both came in. And one of the most marvellous moments in that first festival was Alan and Barry playing the saint song Swan. It was on the recording, if you've heard it, the joke doesn't come across at all because they were swapping so imperceptibly that you couldn't tell who was doing what at any moment unless you really understood their horn tone, but it was, just, it was just a wonderful bit of improvisation um, between two really great players. Um, and I think everybody caught that, you know, to see these two men uh, on the same platform was, was terrific. Yeah, we, we had a meeting in the morning, which we called a round table, which was the first meeting, because we were the British Horn Trust with the whole idea of forming a British Horn Society. And we got together, there's a photograph of Frank, Tony, Holstead, Barry and Alan <clears throat> sat in a line at that um, little conference we had and the audience was absolutely packed. And uh, I um, sort of emceed it, I, I hosted that. And uh, so we got to, shall we form a British Horn Society? You know, everyone, yeah, great. And I said, and of course, I said, for our first present, it's got to be Alan Civil, man, went free. We had this photo shoot in the, in the dried up moat of the Guildhall, they, you know, which was, they emptied it for maintenance and people were down in there, photographs going on, and that famous thing where Alan suddenly yelled out, Right, Willie, open the floodgates! <laughs> he yelled across to me. <laughs> oh dear, which was... Uh, it's funny, and luckily was captured by Dick Merriweather's cartoon, you know. And the evening concert was wonderful, you know, with this, um, with Barry and Alan sharing it. And Alan had, it's really, I, I always, I was always jealous of it. He had this wonderful solid silver flask in which he had a little, you know, so we're having a little tipple in, in what we turned into the green room. So I went out with them behind me to get them out and introduce them. And then suddenly found myself going out there and nobody behind me and suddenly they, they struck up with Colonel Bogey. They decided, <laughs> they, mar they marched me out with Colonel Bogey. Uh, so Alan and Barry were playing, playing that and making it up as they went along and there were extemporizations. <laughs> it was very, very funny. But I remember, you know, the, the backstage um alan was quite sneaky because he got all these loads of horn duets that he was going to play with barry but he kept on forgetting to send barry the music um and i remember him giving the music to barry in the morning and they were doing it either in the afternoon or the evening i can't remember which one it was playing these horn duets that alan had written and um barry scurrying off to a practice room and just frantically practicing um, these horn duets that, and and sort of then sort of seeing Alan sort of sneakily sniggering under his breath because he happened to have forgotten to send him the music. It was marvellous. That guild was full of 
horn players going around. And of course, there's a big exhibition. Um, and uh, people like Rossetti and, you know, all, all these people have come, come along um, just because they'd heard all about it on the radio, they wanted to be part of it. And of course, that was going on all the time. There were, you know, 15,000 different variants of, of the Seafried horn call and <laughs> going on, you know, just marvellous, marvellous day all the way around. Lots of people, um, lots of friends. I think what was attractive about it was we had a lot of, we really did young, we had a lot of young people coming there. And remember, Egmont had been very much the preserve of hotshot uh, professional horn octets. It probably hadn't occurred to people that you could get 300 mixed groups playing the, the Egmont Overture. Um, I think it was getting a wide range of people, the age, the professionalism, and uh, just that, just that. Well, I had to get Tim up there, young Tim, because to support Eric Terwilliger, thank goodness, up there, some other guys, uh, two of two of my Danish pals were up there, the good high players. Um, Michel Gasson Barreau was playing first, thank goodness. But we wanted to spread round, so Frank positioned himself on eighth, and. Uh, which was which was quite quite interesting, really, in that I'm, we put the stands out. We were so busy. I got stands out, music out, and all that sort of thing. And then when people came in, I was trying to get stands equally done with equal strength. And lots of the kids wanted to be near Frank, who instantaneously become their hero. You see, and um, uh, and then there were tears as they suddenly realised. Of course, there's a bass clef, <laughs> which they'd never done. Oh dear, so I had to go and mop tears and get them all sorted again. And uh, eventually we did it the best we can. But there were a lot of players missing because any pros who'd come down and other players had met up with pals they hadn't seen for ages and they'd all gone down the pub. When it just first started, you know, the first chord, you know, and have Alan conducting his own arrangement, it was just, yeah, the sound was just, it really is extraordinary to have mass horns anyway, but 300 odd people. And what was so, was so lovely about it, it was, um, it was like everybody played. You know, obviously the, there were professionals there and there were kids, it was the whole thing, it was all, sort of what the, the Horn Society stands for it. It was the whole. Everybody played the professionals, the the keen amateurs, the amateurs, the kids. Everybody just played it, and that's what I think. That's what made it so extraordinary. That it was just this whole whole um, range of talent, and you know, some people could barely play anything, but it sort of didn't matter. It it was just wonderful to get together. <laughs>